Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's webinar, Emerging Data Quality Trends for Governing and Analyzing Big Data, sponsored today by SyncSort. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions by Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Harold Smith. Harold is the Director of Product Management at SyncSort, responsible for the Trillium Software product line and co-author of Patterns of Information Management, published by IBM Press. Harold has spent the last past 20 years specializing in information quality, integration, and governance products with a focus on accelerating customer value and delivering innovative solutions. He has written extensively on integration, management, and use of information. Harold has been issued four patents in the field of data management and integration. And with that, I will give the floor to Harold to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thanks, Shannon, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you're located. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Uh, what I want to talk about is really some emerging trends in data quality. Uh, data quality is obviously not new. Uh, we, we've been in the field for many years working on some of these particular challenges, uh, and, and there's a lot of things that remain constant over this time. But one of the things I do want to do today is talk a little bit about some of the ongoing data challenges, uh, look at four distinct uh, emerging trends you know, that, that we've really seen developing over the last couple of years, and some of the approaches to addressing some of the ongoing data quality needs. Uh, you know, obviously, in a session like this, you know, this is not going to be completely comprehensive. There, there's a whole field out there in terms of looking at some of these challenges around data quality. But we do want to highlight uh, some of the things that you really need to be cognizant of as we're dealing with some of the ongoing changes in the uh, data landscape. You know, I, I think a lot of us, you know, have talked over the years about, you know, why data quality is so important, uh, particularly today where, you know, we just see so many different uh, applications, so many different uh, analytical tools being applied. Uh, you know, businesses really trying to drive new insight uh, based on what they know about customers and products, um, operations. The data that we've collected is really driving you know some fundamental changes in the industry. You know, and, and you know this, this again is not something that's you know just emerged. You know. You know, this week, this year, you know, this has been developing over the last uh, several years, you know, potentially even over the last decade. But we see more and more of this, really an acceleration of, you know, the, the application of data to ongoing problems. And this is something that, you know, obviously does encompass, you know, kind of the whole range of, of business. I mean, we see it in terms of, you know, certain types of, you know, applications, you know, in terms of being able to focus on things like marketing, marketing segmentation, single customer view, but it really expands everything. It expands into operations, how we're handling finance, how we're looking at overall management and the overall business strategy, even aspects of, you know, legal, you know, compliance. So there's, you know, an ongoing demand for data in all of these areas you know, that affect every one of our uh, organizations. So these aspects in terms of, you know, looking at kind of governing around, <laughs> governance around the data uh, and data quality really becomes kind of top of mind, you know, as, as we're looking at some of these prior challenges. You know, and some of that, you know, is, you know, you know the classics are three Vs of, of big data, volume, variety, velocity, you know, continuing to grow and accelerate, we see ever more analysis. You know, we're constantly looking at, you know, the ways that data science is exploring information, that we're trying to drive new insights, tools that allow us more and more dissection of, of data and segmentation of information. But with all this data, the, the new tools, there's sort of a you know, dichotomy that comes out of this. You know, it's expectations on what we can do continue to grow, yet at the same time, 
you know, we see ongoing challenges in terms of trust and confidence in that information. Uh, we see more, you know, indications that there, there's growing challenges in terms of trying to deal with the quality of that, that data. And at the same time, there's more regulations coming into play around the use and, and a, uh, application of that information as well. You consider, you know, just a couple use cases as we look at, you know, how we're trying to apply data. 360 degree view of customer. What does that mean? You know, get to know me. Get to know me as a customer of your organization. I want to be able to interact with you effectively. I want individualized experience. You know, we see this every day when we go into an Amazon store or other uh, web stores online, uh, engaging with um, organizations that are selling, delivering services to us. We want that individual experience. And organizations are trying to deliver that because that, that's a way to, you know, really gain market share, mind share. Uh, but doing that requires a lot of data. We have a lot of that data internally. We have, you know, our customer master systems, our point of sale data. But increasingly, we're trying to get more third-party data, the things that tell us about who you are, age, occupation, whether there's information that should be suppressed. Have you changed address? Have you passed away? Uh, you know, is there do not call information? And then we're also trying to understand how you interact with social media. What information can we learn about you through that? So there's a lot of information being collected just about individuals. And, you know, this is, you know, obviously a core driver of a number of core use cases. If we take, a, you know, another different one, a little bit more compliance related, Piece. You know, we see this in anti-fraud, anti-money laundering, uh, you know, usually around more protection of financial assets, compliance, you know, regulations, being able to flag, you know, alerts in real time or identify and report on, uh, you know, transactions of data. Again, you know, there's internal data that helps drive some of this core content, but we see more and more mobile data. You know, I've signed in with a new device. I think I just did that on my phone yesterday into one of my applications. And, you know, that's something that, you know, is this you? You know, we want to be able to connect these pieces together so we can make sure that, you know, we're having the, the right experience, that we're maintaining the trust of our customers in our organizations. There's a lot of data challenges here. You know, there's a huge volume of information. We have to deal with the real-time data challenges. This has to be known now, not a day from now, we have to be able to capture a lot of things in terms of content that we didn't before. What's the geolocation information? Is this time-based? Uh, you know, do I know what this device is or what the browser is that I'm coming in from? So a lot of information to be able to learn about. And as we're dealing with the, the sort of big data content, you know, it really becomes critical to have high quality information so we're making the right decisions. We're having the right interactions uh, with our customers uh, so that we're getting the right responses. You know, it's decision making. It's about, you know, am I talking to the correct person? <laughs> Do I know who you are? Do I know what you've been doing and how you've been interacting with us so I can respond most effectively? And can we start to make effective predictions based on, you know, machine learning and AI uh, models and, and algorithms? But as we look at, you know, the response here, you know, the, the levels of trust, you know, 35% of senior executives have high level of trust, but that means 65% don't. We have a lot of executives in our organizations concerned about the negative impact of uh, data and analytics on the corporate reputation uh, in terms of how we're interacting with you. One of the, the recent statistics I found most interesting was that 80% of AI and machine learning projects are now stalling due to poor data quality. You know, you think about all these things that we're trying to do with this data to be effective, and data quality is impacting our experience. 
And that says that you know, we need to look very closely at what's happening in terms of data quality in the industry. How do we respond effectively to this changing dynamics? What's new that we need to know about so that we're not you know, just focus on the, the same old pieces and ignoring things that are coming into play? So what I want to do now is, is really look at you know, four key trends. And I think it's an important piece here to state that, you know, this doesn't mean that our traditional data quality goes away. Those issues remain. You know, we, we still have to deal with data quality that, you know, we've established over the years. But there are some additional pieces that we now need to consider. First of those is simply new types of data which have differing qualities that we need to be thinking about. And, and we'll look at this in a little bit more detail. We have some new application considerations, and it, particularly here in terms of looking at machine learning and AI-related components. What's going on there that we need to be thinking about that may be distinct? Processing at scale, meeting service level agreements, you know, these you know, there, there's always been a need to be able to address time windows, but the, the volumes of data that we're now seeing are things that we need to be cognizant of as we're looking at data quality components. And then the, really the fourth trend is the whole aspect in terms of data democratization and, and really data literacy and some of the, you know, the resource and knowledge constraints and maybe even just how we're thinking about data you know, is, is something that we need to think about from a data quality perspective. So let's look at new data, new measure. Now, as I said, all of our common data problems still exist. And even as we begin to look at new sources of data, new types of data, these problems still remain. We still have to think about you know, these aspects in terms of you know, data formats, is it consistent? Do we have standardization of our information? Are we dealing with free form fields that have mixed domains of data that we need to think about? How do we parse this out and get that uh, resolved? Are we dealing with usual issues of spelling? You know, things that have potentially been, uh, you know, creating, you know, a lot of our sort of core issues. All of these, you know, are, are ongoing challenges. They haven't gone away. And these are the things that we've established a lot of core dimensions for data quality around. Is it complete? Do we have relevant information populated? Do we have the integrity of information? Is the data unique or not? Does it have the right validity? Do I have the correct values, the right ranges? Does it match up to my reference data sources? Is it consistent? You know, do, I, do I see consistency over time in terms of this overall content in it, and did it arrive on time? So these things are all components that we want to continue to take advantage of and be focused on. They are still important. You know, and if you think about some you know, pieces of information, say, you know, a you know, call center record, you know, these are things that I can you know, do some of that check marks in. Is it unique? Yeah. Is, does it have the right integrity? Yes. Is it consistent? Yes. Is it complete? Well, you know, there's some aspects here that, you know, a file may be complete or, or appear complete, but does that really represent the full set of information I look, need to look at? So we, we need to begin to think about how, how we focus on completeness of information and, and validity of information. You know, is it, you know, particular pieces of information important? You know, that need to be able to understand the business requirements, you know, is an ongoing focus. And it, also understanding what that means in terms of the context of, of some of these sources of information. But if we look at something like, you know, a, a social media feed, you know, a JSON file coming off of Twitter, is that complete? Does it have the right integrity? You know, is it unique? You know, you think about retweets, you know, then, you know, sharing, you know, reshares. What does that do to uniqueness? What does it mean to be valid or consistent in, in some of these contexts? Yeah, so there, as we get into some of these feeds on social media, uh, other 
third-party sources, we have to begin to examine other aspects. So there's new data quality problems that come into play. How is this even gathered? What's the provenance of this information? Is it something I can rely on? Do I know how it was even collected? And for what purpose was it collected? That is something that we have to think about. Is, and that, because one of the pieces that comes into play here is the bias in the data. Has this data been structured in a way that it has particular ramifications in terms of what I'm going to learn downstream in machine learning um, algorithms that may skew my results in a way that I'm not expecting? So we have to be looking at you know, fundamental issues in terms of bias. We have to understand data. If there's no standardized structure or formatting, what do we need to do with that? Or if we're looking at continuously streaming data, what are the ramifications you know, of that? You know, what happens if I have a gap in that stream? How do I understand that and what that is doing to my data? Do I need to try and establish some level of consistency with other pieces of information or understand the changes that have happened to that data? You know, you think about kind of our information supply chain and what's come in through my web applications and then it's gone into my CRM or my ERP systems and then funneled into a data warehouse and then I've passed on some of that content into my data lake or particular zones in my data lake. What has happened along the, the way there? And what does that mean? Have I done levels of aggregation along the way that I may not be anticipating? So we need to be able to understand how that data has been processed along the way. This raises questions about whether you know, the set of you know, dimensions you know, that we have, uh, or at least how we often typically define those, are adequate to addressing some of the problems. Now, I'm not going to necessarily say that you know, these are all you know, brand new measures, but they're, I, they're important aspects of the dimensions that we look at or extend those dimensions in ways that are going to be important to us. One of those fundamental pieces is provenance. Where did this data come from? Who gathered it? What was the criteria used to create it? That's an important piece because if I don't have confidence on how this information was gathered, when it was gathered, you know, we're getting you know, third-party mailings that's like, yo, do you want this mailing list that has this list of all these, you know, contacts? Well, when did you create it? How do I know it's even valid for what I need to do? We need to be asking those particular questions and understand that and be able to apply that. Does it have the right coverage? Is it the relevant geography you know, for us to be thinking about? Does it have particular bias in terms of how it's been gathered? Do we have all the points of data? You think about sensor data, you know, uh, mobile phone data, weather records. Do we get a continuous feed? Do we get some gaps in there? If I have a gap, what does that mean? If I don't have this sensor data today, is that good or bad and different? Do I just work around that? What does that do if I'm applying analysis based on some of this particular content? And does it, is it generating the right data? You know, and you think about things that may be injected into bigger content. You know, a, a simple example here is, you know, if I have you know, temperature data from Boston, I have temperature data from New York, I kind of expect the temperature in Hartford to be somewhere fairly close to you know, those particular pieces of information. But what if it's not? Does that mean the sensor is out? Does that mean I pulled from the wrong piece of information? Is there something wrong with the sensor? There's a lot of different questions, but it raises into uh, questions in our mind about the, the value of that piece of data. And then as we're looking at transformations, you know, are, you know we're seeing in different aggregations, what does that do to our data? Can we determine, you know, what's happened to that particular content? And if potentially we're getting repetition or duplication of that, that information. So a lot of different pieces for us to consider. Um, but as we begin to look at some of these things, you, know, you can begin to ask different questions on something like a social media feed. 
well, well, it's Providence, okay. And Jane Doe pulled this. She pulled all the items for a particular time period based on, you know, hashtag Blackberry. It could be, you know, hashtag Dataversity today, you know, that we're, we're pulling in. Um, do we have a good sense of how it fits with, you know, the other information we're trying to use it with? Yeah. Um, any changes? No. It's good. We, it's, you know, the raw content. You know, that's often a useful piece to know as we're working with this component. But it include all the relevant pieces. You know, are there acronyms? Are there other ways that we can say, you know, particular pieces, uh, names? You know, does Data Diversity have another uh, acronym that we may, may need to pull from? These are all things that we need to be able to apply, assess, and measure as we're looking at new content. Go. So let's talk about, a little bit about new applications. New machine learning um, has its own particular aspects. Uh, there's a lot to machine learning that's you know well beyond what we're focusing on here. But I, I think it's very important that, you know as, as we're looking at things around machine learning and artificial intelligence and what we can do with these algorithms and, and models is you know they're still based on data. We're taking some data in. We're building models on it. We're trying it out, validating it. What's the quality of that data that we're using? Are there aspects of that data that we need to be aware so that you know what we're feeding in is quality data, and we're not in a you know if the model is good, we should have a good result. But you know if we're feeding junk in. What are we going to get in that model? And what's that going to do to our interpretations downstream? So this is an important aspect. And obviously, there's a lot of different applications that are coming out here. You know, just you know, some media examples in terms of you know, marketing. We have targeted marketing, recommendation engines, next best actions, we have risk management, you know, fraud detection, anti-money laundering are certainly good aspects of that. Know your customer. You know, these are things that are working with a lot of data that we're, we're well familiar with, but we're now beginning to apply this in a ways that we're trying to pr make predictions, um, you know, around you know this content and what we can think of maybe a particular future based on this. So there's a number of data challenges inherent, you know, with machine learning itself. These are not necessarily data quality per se, you know, you know, just being able to find, access, and <laughs> obtain data uh, that may be useful, you know, it is one of those challenges. It's not necessarily a data quality per se, but we do begin to look at things like data cleansing. And can we do that at scale that we need for machine learning? Entity resolution, customer identification, data matching is a very standard data quality practice. We have some needs for real-time current data. Uh, you know, just being able to address the streams of information, the volumes of information, uh, trace some of that. They all begin to touch on some of those aspects of data quality, even though they have broader data challenges as well. But when we look very specifically at some of the data quality challenges, you know, the, some of the things that you know we we see here are, you know, incorrect and misformatted or maybe even sparse information. You know, these are things that, you know, will impact the data sets that you're trying to apply from a machine learning standpoint. And you, you, we can apply certain things in terms of correcting and standardizing that information, but there's a kind of a challenge there as well. It's like we can help to build some of that signal, if you will, by resolving some of these data quality challenges. At the same time, we have to be very aware of, are we introducing our own assumptions and assertions and, and biases when we do so? And does that then mask certain patterns that we might otherwise see? Aspects of missing context. So, you know, we, we look at some of these aspects in terms of new data sources pulling new sets of information in, but you know, do we get a complete population? Do we have other pieces of information that may be important to inform us about the populations that maybe we're not 
interacting with, but could potentially interact with. One of the things we don't want to do is be so focused on the population of data that you know is very limited to our existing customer base per se that we're then missing things very important that are going on around that. Aspects in terms of multiple copies as well. You know, we, we have a lot of information coming in from a lot of different content, multiple third-party sources. Who pulled what, when? Do we have multiple copies that may be impacting it? Do we have duplication of information or partial duplication of information that may now be impacting what we're feeding into our models that we're not, not aware of? Being able to remove some of that duplication is going to be an important piece, but maybe even more critical is going to be, you know, can we really resolve this into single entities that we can make, you know, real valid decisions around? And the other thing we, we do have to be cognizant of is various correlations that just may exist within our data, and this is one of the things that's very important about applying things like uh, data profiling capabilities and dependency analysis as we begin to look at some of these data sources. You know, it's very easy to pull in a, a file based on particular content or contact information that has my name, address, other components, but, you know, we, we do have to remember that it's like, odds are for purposes of being high quality information in its original context. We have state codes, we have zip codes, we have other pieces of information that all basically correlate to the same point, that we're from a particular geographic area. We may need to be pulling that out so that we don't have correlations being based in the models on things we already know and aren't giving us analytical insights that we don't know and really want to be able to get. Just some examples of this, missing segments of population, Hurricane Sandy. Lots of tweets, a lot of information to correlate together, but the tweets weren't coming from the hardest hit areas because there were power outages, diminishing cell phone batteries. There weren't very many Spanish language tweets, even though a lot of Spanish speakers were affected you know, in that. We're missing segments of population. Similar aspects in terms of looking at something like the Boston potholes, yeah. we draw on accelerometer and GPS data to help passively identify potholes. But groups that didn't have smartphones weren't being recorded and incorporated into this particular piece. So the information that's being collected will tell us a lot about where people who had smartphones we're going and driving and where their issues were, but not necessarily about the broader issues uh, around. So things like missing segments are going to be important and for us to acknowledge where we have population or uh, data gaps. Similarly, we have to be very aware of noise coming into the process or inserted content. Bot tweets are, you know, I think probably, you know, the best example of this. You know, there's a lot of things producing lots of various information, uh, whether it's based on elections, whether it's based on other pieces of information, maybe it's even things being fed in about particular products and, you know, people having issues with particular product. There's a lot of potential noise here. And how do we filter that out? This is a data quality problem. We have to be able to determine what's valid, what's invalid. We want to be able to make effective use of it. And then we have, you know, just simple bias aspects. And, you know, we see this probably particularly in terms of certain types of uh, unstructured data content and uh, analysis, you know, that may then be brought into it. But, you know, I, you know the, the black sheep problem is the one that kind of caught my attention just because from an English perspective, English language perspective, I have lots of connotations about what black sheep is and, and a black sheet meaning, and we bring that into a lot of different sources of information. Problem is that then creates correlations and connotations that don't necessarily reflect anything in terms of 
sheep and sheep population <laughs> and what's the actual proportion of, of content. So bias can begin to work in a lot of different ways. This is just a very simple example. There's a lot of good information out about you know, how we need to think about uh, bias in, in our data. Data quality at scale, we, we've been dealing with this for a while, but it's a continuing, ongoing problem. Uh, in our uh, recent uh, data quality survey that uh, the Sensor did, one of the, you know, the two of the top three items were many sources of data and the volume of data as being, you know, real barriers to ensuring high data quality. Uh, you know, and I, I don't think this is surprising. Um, at the EDW conference earlier this year, Michael Stonebreaker was talking about the 800-pound gorilla in the room, and by that he was talking about the variety of data and the number of systems that have a lot of the same data or related or correlated data. We have to deal with a lot of information and addressing this at a level you know, that's meaningful. So when we think about all of these data quality dimensions and, and the, the challenges with these data sets, we have to be thinking about how are we handling data volumes and uh, distributed data. We're putting more and more data out, not, not just Hadoop, but now onto the various distributed cloud platforms, whether it's AWS or Azure or, or Google Cloud or, or others. But this has impact to how we're looking at and working with you know, data quality. If we think about profiling data. We have to deal with very high volumes. We have to potentially think about how we might approach streaming data, which is an area that we don't typically profile. But, you know, we're, we're not in a position to have meaningful content if we're looking at individual records at a time from a, from a data stream. So we may be in a position where we have to gather samples out of a stream or time segments out of a stream, begin to make extrapolations around that. So we need to be thinking about either those high volumes or the streaming content as we begin to look at how do we understand the data and the data quality issues. As we're looking at standardizing and enriching data content or matching entities, and not just master data now, but you know, dealing with master data correlated with a lot of transactional data and mobile data and pieces that are coming in with partial bits of, of information, whether it's a device number, IP address, browser uh, associated with that. How do we match that? How do we do that at a scale uh, and often in a real-time basis? And, and do it in a way that's going to allow us to meet you know, service level agreements at the same time. We have to be thinking about the time windows that we're approaching you know, data quality requirements in. So, and this is going to require us to also deal with ongoing changing platforms. You would think about you know, cloud errors, acquisition of Hortonworks. Well, that changes potentially platforms or people who have moved on to uh, distributed platforms and now moving on to cloud platforms. Can we apply the same data quality processes? Can we get our tools out into those environments and those platforms in a way that's going to allow us you know, to be effective and, and, and valuable? So there's important pieces as we look at, you know, kind of handling these sort of distributed volumes. You know, there's, you know, we have to be able to address data quality functions uh, consistently, you know, at scale, no matter where the actual processing is, is taking place, how that data is segmented, what the, the volume is. You know, and there, you know, the demands are constant here, but, you know, we still have to look at how do we parse that information? Do we need to standardize it? Does it have to be validated as we go through these particular processes? Those are all key parts of our data quality process. There may be more elements that we have to look at now in terms of, you know, looking at segments of population too, but these are still functions that have to be applied and they have to be applied at scale. We have to be able to look at this in terms of data enrichment as well. Where are we getting our particular sources? How are we connecting that you know, across our distributed platforms? And when are we applying the, that aspect in terms of enrichment or, or lookups? Is it while we're going through our operational systems? Or is it downstream where we've suddenly 
pulled together in you know, X number of systems of records from our different siloed business applications and now need to aggregate it and who has the right reference information. Have we even standardized it to that point? Those are going to be considerations as we look at the overall application architecture. There's some also additional considerations as we look at things like profiling, you know, also to send in sort of joining, sorting information, but matching information as well. If you think about something like data profiling, we have to be able to find these outliers. We need to be able to look, in effect, for the needles in the haystack to be able to say, where are these particular issues? If we're just looking at particular samples of information, that's useful for certain types of things. If we're applying how we going to model, you know, what the data is going into. But as we really look to understand the data quality problems more and more, we have to look at the full volume. We have to find these outliers and be able to understand how they got there and be able to address those particular challenges. That means we have to be able to apply our profiling across clusters of information. We have to be able to aggregate across that. We have to be able to aggregate the frequency distributions and be able to provide access to pieces that we want to be able to drill down to in a time-effective manner. Similarly, from a standpoint of entity resolution, distinguishing matches at scale. There's a lot of information we want to look at, there, which means there's a lot of cross-comparisons, and we have more different components that we're now looking at. It's not enough to be able to say, okay, I need to you know, pull together things that have pieces of information from, based on this segment of name content, this segment of address content, maybe some phone information, some um, you know, social security numbers or tax IDs, national IDs, but now I have vice IDs, now I have IP addresses. Where have I collected that? How have I linked that into my master data information or my single customer view? The number of types of puzzle pieces are growing, and the things that we need to do in terms of comparing not just once you know, across you know, a, a, you know, these couple of dimensions, but to compare this way, and now I need to compare in this other dimension, in this other dimension, so there's an, a growing number of comparisons we have to do that are going to necessitate us handling high volume comparison information. You know, an example, you know, going back to, you know, one of the core use cases, and we see a lot of global banks dealing with anti-money laundering and, you know, doing this on distributed platforms. You know, this is critical. Uh, you know, almost every one of you is going to be, you know, dealing with aspects in terms of, you know, fraud, you know, on your credit cards, same type of thing in terms of dealing with anti-money laundering and, and the transactions going through the particular bank. We have to be able to leverage machine learning at scale uh, to be able to understand new and emerging patterns that requires large volumes, current, plain information. That information has to be accessible, be able to be fed into the algorithms, it means we need to be constantly thinking about how we cleanse, standardize, match that information, and do it in an effective way that's then going to support the algorithms downstream. So all these pieces begin to tie together as we look at new types of data, machine learning, handling data at scale. These come together in terms of how we're looking at uh, data quality. And then that, really that last trend, data literacy, data democratization. What does that particularly you know, mean to us as we're looking at data quality? But from a data literacy standpoint, you know, the, and the data democratization ideal is that every one of us in our organizations and all of our colleagues in our organizations are going to understand data, and we're going to understand some of the basics of data. We're going to understand the business context, business language that goes around that data. We're going to understand some of the basics of data. What is a data structure? What's a data type? What does it mean? For me, they'll be looking at numerics versus alpha versus alphanumeric information or a range of date formats, and what does that mean in terms of how I'm looking at and thinking about that data content? 
I have to think about how do I find and access data, how do I use it. But as we begin to look at you know, some aspects in terms of data quality, it's going to be things like basic statistics. If I'm looking at a frequency distribution of dates and I say, okay, well, you know, January 1st every year it's you know, twice the volume or three times the volume of every other date in the, the year, what does that mean? to me, what can I interpret out of that? Odds are somebody somewhere is using that as a default date. That's not in line with what we'd expect the typical distribution of a population to be. Some of those basic statistics are going to come into play. We need to understand the data quality dimensions. We need to be thinking about what are the things I need to be looking at and what questions do I need to ask around this information. And then what techniques and tools can I apply to this? This is all part of our data literacy, part of what we need to be able to do. And one of the things that you know, I really appreciate about you know, data diversity, being able to provide a lot of this type of content and learning available to a large uh, group of individuals. But this does you know, come up against aspects in terms of resource constraints. There's only so much time in the day we have to begin to think about this. and to understand some of the data quality challenges. And it continues to change. And that's why it's important to look at some of these emerging trends so that we get that in our mindset as well as we look at how do we approach this. And I think that, you know, that's really sort of a, you know, kind of a good segue into kind of the last pieces I want to look at here, which is some of the things, some of the approaches that we need in place to begin to address some of these emerging data quality trends. And data literacy is really, you know, it's an emerging trend. It's also one of those core approaches that we need to have in play. How do we get best practices about data quality available for everyone in our organizations? You know, anybody who's working with data should be thinking about you know, these particular challenges. That means there's best practices that need to exist somewhere. There's some basic things that we need to be thinking about. Some of these are what I would term sort of our universal best practices. Scope, the right questions, understanding data requirements, thinking about bias, getting the business context right, because we know that customer may mean one thing to this part of the organization and something else to this part of the organization. We have to understand those different contexts. How do we begin to address and resolve, or do we, resolve those data quality issues and apply the right data governance processes. And then we have to begin to think about how we solve some of these challenges at scale. So breaking that down a little bit further, communication, really central to a culture of data literacy. If we're not talking about these things, if we're not discussing it, if we're not helping people understand how to ask questions about the data, to get trained on how to understand and use that data, then we're not going to be able to be effective. We are going to still be plagued by different aspects that are going to come into the data that we're not anticipating. So we have to be trained to understand and use the data and also understand how do we approach and evaluate data quality, whether that's traditional data, whether that's what's in our Excel spreadsheets, whether that's what we need for our machine learning algorithms. But again, understand the business context that's coming into play with these data sets we're presented with. It's critical for us to have programs of data governance as part of this. These are the foundational processes and practices necessary for success that are going to allow us to measure, monitor, and improve data quality where it's needed. It's a continuous iteration. It's this, none of this is one time. This is a cultural aspect. And that's one of the things I think we've seen repeatedly at a lot of our uh, core data quality, data governance conferences over the years, have the importance of programs of data governance, the importance of communication, and the culture of data literacy. And having a place, basically a center of excellence or a knowledge base, where you can go to find answers. These are central to establishing an effective data quality program. We know some of these core challenges 
common terminology, organizational barriers, isolated or unknown work. These are all things that are going to impact our ability to be effective uh, and really drive out a communication program. So we need to be able to have that place of a common language. Where do we gain broader buy-in? How do we continue to get everybody in the organization to really understand the impacts that the data has? And this is where it's so important to be able to provide upfront examples, you know, things that I can get out of, you know, a data profiling process or I can get out of applying business rules where I can get actual measurements and say, is this an issue and how do I begin to raise that up and understand what the value or cost of that, that issue is. Scope is important, you know, as we look at data quality, you know, going beyond that communication to, you know, looking at programs of data quality, how do I understand the business objective and problem? You know, we have to ask the right questions, you know, about the data and we have to empower users to ask those questions. As I begin to look at something like a machine learning application, I'm going to have some different questions coming into play than I necessarily would on an upfront web application or an operational application. I need to think about all the pieces that are going to come into play and where you know, those segments of data are that I need to bring into that piece and in that picture. So I need to look at, you know, do we have the data required? Or do I understand those characteristics? This is a constant process with any application, with any business initiative that's leveraging data. We have to figure out what's fit for our purpose. Have we evaluated the data? What are the answers that we can bring out of this? And ultimately, you know, we're driving to understand, you know, what are the critical data elements that we need for these particular pieces? You know, we're, you know, we're not asking for what's the best data set. We don't understand what the best data set is if we haven't asked these particular questions, if we haven't understood the context, if we don't understand the data elements. Once we do have that context in place, now we can begin to say what do we expect? What are those measurements that we need to apply? How do we put that into an overall governance process so that we can deploy these and apply measurements on an ongoing basis? And that leads into that sort of core step of quantifying everything that we do. So a lot of hidden activities, a lot of things we spend our time on that's not necessarily effective. There's a lot of things that we don't have a transparent view in. The more things that we can bring into our view, the, the more transparency we can bring in, you know, through things like, you know, baseline measurements, understanding what the measurements mean and why they're important and what the business value or the business process is. How do we look at monitoring that information and reporting on it in a way that's going to be collaborative and continue to communicate with others? These are going to be important, you know, and we're going to have to do this repeatedly. And none of these approaches are, are new. These are things that we've been trained to do from a data quality perspective for years, but there's more people that we need to communicate these practices to if we really want to have a true data literate culture. And this is going to tie into leveraging tool. It's, you know, there's a communication aspect. How do we get out to everybody? How do we put processes in place? How do we get people educated on that? How do we put tools in their hands as well? This is going to be an important piece to look at the challenges of scale. It's going to be a challenge to apply consistent processes. And this is, I think, one of those things that we often overlook from a data quality perspective. It's one thing to say, okay, I understand the data issues here, here, and here, but if I'm not standardizing things in a consistent way or if I'm not applying consistent uh, approaches for resolving entities and matching entities and I'm doing one thing here, one thing there, and I'm ending up with these different data sources or data sets that have different levels of information, different aggregations, I'm still not going to be able to build trust. I need to be able to look at consistency of what we're applying to the data at the same time so I can 
have that sense that I have the right measures and the right corrective actions in place and do that throughout the overall process and I get you know, a, a solid, trustable result at the end of the process. So these are things we're going to have to look at, you know, deploying effectively, uh, you know, uh, over time, and really think about how do we do that in a way that allows people who are not technical experts to be able to get routines and processes and rules in place without having to think about the, the technical environment that they're deploying into. Being able to think about a you know, simplifying the process, you know, design it once, deploy it anywhere. You know, we, we think about this from a, a profiling standpoint all the time. It's just like I have a profiling process and I deploy it down, I connect the data, I run it, I get results. I'm not thinking about what's happening in between. It's a consistent process because we've built that and established that as a standard routine. Other things we're often building from hand, we need to be able to establish that ability to deploy those pieces as well consistently, whether into from test, into production, from on-premise to cloud, from one cloud to another. So we're valuing the data quality skills and the data knowledge and the data literacy and not trying to resolve technical issues all the time. Fundamentally, data quality is still data quality whether at scale, whether with new data sources, old ones, whether we're trying to establish a practice of data literacy in our organization, data quality is still data quality. And it's something that we have to embed as an ongoing process in our practice. So thanks for the, for the time. Let me uh, turn it over uh, for any Q&A that we may have at this point. Carol, thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. Uh, just to answer the most commonly asked questions here, there's a high demand for the slides and the recording. So just a reminder, I will send out that both of, uh, links to both of those in the follow-up email, which will go out to all registrants by end of day Monday. So uh, diving in here to the questions, you know, the hot topic, Harold, and, and, and always the in question that comes up, so who should be involved and responsible for data quality? Uh, making sure that it's accurate and not old. Well, if we really want to say that we have democratized data, then we have to be saying everybody. You know, I, I think, you know, this is a goal of a data literate culture. We have to be saying everybody is responsible for data. Yes, we, we obviously establish data owners. We have subject matter experts who are going to be able to provide insight. But anybody who's working with data, who's working with you know, business initiatives and business processes has a responsibility to look at and understand what they're working with. Now, some of that may just be at a level of looking at you know, what is, you know, what's the business context, what's the process, but being able to spot, hey, this does not look right. How do I ask the question? How do I raise this as an issue and who do I raise it to? And this is part of that, that aspect of really bringing a data literate culture in place. Yeah, this is not, not an easy task. I mean, this is what, you know, we see chief data officers charged with or data governance councils charged with, but it can't be done alone or in isolation. You know, this is a, it comes both from a top-down acceptance that data is really a valuable asset. You know, I think that's one of the things that Doug Laney is often preaching is or data is an asset in your organization and you need to be able to think about it from that standpoint and do that right from the executive management. We are going to value data and we're going to work that through and we're going to need to put things in place that help individuals become literate about the data they're working with and feel an ownership and a responsibility for helping to get it right at the points where they're working with that data. So how does one socialize data quality for everyone? Well, it's, it's been an ongoing challenge. I mean, I, I think I've seen this over the years at our, our various data governance and data quality conferences. How do I, how do I approach that? I think we, we've had a lot of good sessions, uh, you know, at, at these events talking about that. 
I don't think there's a really a, a, a one size fits all. I mean, I think this is going to be you know very much an organizational um, process in terms of you know putting things in place. But it, it's going to require having a, you know a number of capabilities that that you know really are fundamental data governance processes and, and practices. Um, how do I begin to establish? You know, a center of excellence or a knowledge base. Uh, you know, we see this. You know, one approach people have taken. You know, is through you know, like the business glossaries and the, and the data catalog. So I can begin to say, okay, there's a, here's a common language. Everybody can quickly reference a, a term and be able to say, okay, what is customer? Oh, okay, this is what it means. But be aware that in this part of the organization, it has this understanding. So. Uh, those business glossaries, policy management systems, some of the things we see in the data governance tools provide us some of that way to begin to collect uh, and centralize some of that focus so that everybody can collaborate and contribute. And I, I think that's going to be, you know, really a core starting point in, in a lot of these journeys. Uh, or having a way to, you know, start. sometimes it's going to be starting small where, you know, it's going to be in this particular unit. I'm going to put, you know, I know I have a problem here, and I know this is impacting our business, you know, in this way. How do I measure that? Does this, you know, resonate with execs and, and data owners who are in, in line of business and, and higher management so we can begin to say, how do I expand on this and, and put things in place that are going to help us uh, drive more revenue, reduce costs, or you know, reduce risk. You know, and it's always I think going to come back to a lot of those business equations that are going to be key drivers in, in being able to move some of this forward. Key words there, certainly. And uh, so, uh, our data validation rules applied to data as it is ingested and processed in the data lake, or is it profiled after as this data is ingested? And to follow up on that, how would data be re, uh, remediated, whether data issues are determined before with validation rules or after through profiling? I mean, it's a very good question. I, I think one of the things we have to be thinking about is, is, is data is not, you know, static at particular points in time. So we, we've pushed information through what you might term sort of the supply chain. You know, these things are going to come in through all sorts of different applications, um, you know, and I think it's, it's very important for us to have, you know, validation pieces right up front. You know, we have, you know, web applications and the like in terms of how we collect data. At the same time, we, we have to be aware that, you know, if I go onto somebody's website and it, it's, you know, to order something and, you know, I, I'm going to need to be able to put my shipping information so the you know, whatever I'm ordering gets to me. But, you know, if I'm ordering pizza, I don't want to go through that, you know, and I don't want to be hassled. And if you're going to hassle me on that, I'm going to go somewhere else. So we have, there's going to be these sort of things we have to take into account up front um, in our applications. There are going to be things we need to have validation rules around right there. And those are going to, you know, ripple through pieces of our, our processing. Worked with an organization uh, quite some time ago in terms of dealing with logistics and operational um, supplies. Critical for you know the the goods that they they provide to get delivered on time when needed ASAP. That's mission critical. That has to be done. Validation rules in place for you know those particular pieces, but. As long as things got out the door, that was good. But moving downstream into analytical pieces, well, there's some things going on in the operational side of things that don't necessarily work well from an analytical standpoint. What do I do at that point? Well, that's where you begin to have to put in additional checks, you know, downstream. And that may be in your data warehouse. It may be in your data lake. Maybe it's when you're ingesting so that, you know, you're you know, certain types of things coming in are going to be weeded out. You know, maybe that's going to be on, you know, certain types of third-party data. If it doesn't meet this level of quality, you know, there's a you know, service level agreement for this 
data that I expect, it gets stopped at the point of ingest. Other things may be coming in from our data warehouse into the data lake. It's already gone through the level of checks. I don't need to put additional validation checks moving that over into my data lake, but I need certain other things in terms of profiling that just to make sure that I, I'm up to date with the particular rules that I may need to connect data together. So it, it's going to vary, um, you know, where you are in the supply chain, what's prioritized in terms of uh, operations, analytical needs, um, you know, learning applications that are downstream, and you know, certain types of content, whether it's coming from core operational systems, whether it's coming from third-party systems, other sources that may have low levels of trust and confidence. Some of that may indicate, got to do checks on ingest. Other times, bring it in, let me evaluate it. Maybe it's going to be more of a sandbox approach. Different models for different places. But that's also part of what we have to, you know, apply in that data literacy the context is understanding I may have different rules and requirements at different points in time. Well, Harold, thank you so much for this fantastic presentation today. Always a pleasure doing a webinar with you, and thanks to SyncSart for sponsoring today. But that is all the time we have for today. Uh, again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. I appreciate uh, all the Great questions and the engagement from the community. I love the networking going on throughout the presentation. There's some really cool stuff happening. Um, thanks, everybody, and hope you all have a great day. Harold, thanks so much. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, all.